Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this very special webinar. My name is Camilla Fox, and I'm the founder and executive director of Project Coyote. I'm thrilled and honored to introduce our guest today, Project Coyote ambassador and New York Times bestselling author, Dan Flores. Some of you may be familiar with Dan's fantastic book, Coyote America, which was published in 2016 and became an instant hit and a New York Times bestseller. And I'll share that um, Dan and I were just recalling when we met, and it was back in 2013 when he was working on this book. I will share, I knew very little about Dan. Um, I just knew he wanted to meet me for an interview, and we met in downtown uh, Larkspur, where I live. And um, I think we scheduled it for about an hour, and we ended up there for two or three hours. But needless to say, several years later, his book came out, and um, little did we know what what a, an amazing game changer of a book it would be. And, and we were talking about sort of the timing of when that came out with some of our work around promoting coexistence with coyotes. And um, it's a book to read. So if you haven't read it yet, um, I encourage you to do so. I'm also grateful that since then, Dan has joined our team as a Project Coyote ambassador, um, and I'm grateful for his support of our work for North America's wild carnivores, um, and also for his deep friendship over the years. So to share a little bit about Dan, he is a native of Louisiana and the author of 11 books that focus primarily on the environment, art, and culture of the West. He holds a PhD from Texas A&M University and taught at Texas Tech University, the University of Wyoming and the University of Montana before moving to New Mexico in 2014, where he retired and continues his writing career. His work has been honored by the Western Writers of America, the Denver Public Library, the High Plains Book Awards, the Montana Book Awards, the Oklahoma Book Awards, by the Western History Association, the Montana, Montana Historical Society, and the Texas State Historical Association. His latest book, Wild New World, The Epic Story of Animals and People in America, is already a number one Amazon bestseller, less than a month after its publication, or maybe a little bit more now. <laughs> Before I turn it over to Dan, um, feel free to post any questions that you have during the webinar in the Q&A menu, and we will try to address as many as we can within the hour. And we'll also post various links to Dan's books and other, other works during, during the webinar. So over to you, Dan. Thank you, Camilla. And uh, thanks, of course, for uh, having the idea of doing this webinar. Um, and, uh, you know, I still do remember Camilla and I were talking about our first meeting uh, yesterday uh, where she had really no idea who I was and why I wanted to, to talk to her, but I managed to convince her to, uh, to do so. And so, as she said, we ended up spending about three hours together uh, talking about coyotes. And, uh, and then I had to find two, three years later of sending her an advance uh, copy of that book. And uh, as she said, we've been uh, involved together uh, ever since in, in various kinds of projects on behalf of, of nature, predators, um, and the wider world, really. So, let me, uh, let me start this webinar out and, and let me say to those of you who are listening that uh, what I'll do with this is I'll, I'll do a, a kind of a presentation on the book. I'll try to tell you about uh, how this book began. Um, obviously, it's to some extent an outgrowth of, of Coyote America and another book of mine that came out at the same time uh, that also uh, was a, a bestseller of of sorts, uh, at least in some venues, called American Serengeti, The Last Big Animals of the Great Plains. So uh, I've clearly been doing work on animals for a while, especially uh, sort of the long-term uh, ecological and historical story of animals. So what I'll do is to give you a little bit of a sense of how Wild New World originated, how it fits into the story of uh, that that we've tried to tell about animals in North America, and then I think this will probably maybe uh, use up about fifteen or twenty minutes of our time, and uh, for the rest of the time, uh, I'll just field your questions, and we can we can talk about this. But I want to start out by saying to you that uh, simply this: global climate change is not the first time that humanity has remade the Earth. My book, 
Wild New World is an attempt to engage with one of those other large scale transformations of the planet. It was inspired by Jared Diamond's books, uh, probably uh, most of all his Guns, Germs and Steel, and also by Yuval Harari's Sapiens, which uh, I suspect most of you have read uh, one or, or both of those, those particular books. So in other words, this is a book that is written as a historical and scientific narrative, but it covers, unlike a lot of books uh, that deal with historical subjects, this one covers a span of 66 million years down to early this year, early 2022. So this is a, a kind of writing that's known as big history. It's um, uh, in historical terms, uh, a pretty rare field. Uh, not many works are out there in so-called big history because people who write history uh, largely rely on documentary sources and write about events that are close in time uh, to the modern human experience. But this one is a book that uh, starts, as I said, far, far back in time and attempts to track a story down to the present day. Uh, and I will say that however daunting it was to, to, to attempt something like that uh, in any length of, of uh, pages, really, I mean, this could easily have been a 1,200-page uh, book, but I tried to, to write a reader-friendly version of this story. So my, uh, my commitment from the very beginning was to make this a book that uh, ended up at, at fewer than 400 pages. And uh, I just barely made that, that figure. Uh, it's 390 page, or 98 pages of text. Uh, so that was my, my effort to try to do this story in 400 pages at a length where someone could sit down and over uh, three or four days uh, of of reading managed to uh, really understand this long-term story of the role of wild animals and human beings in North America. So I should tell you that, uh, and this explains something about the kind of books I write, I was an English major as an undergraduate. So I'm drawn to writing narrative uh, and I'm also drawn to rely on storytelling and character development to advance the plot of a story. But I will say also that my interest and in my further education led me to history. That's what I got my PhD in, uh, and particularly uh, the history of environmental issues, which was a pretty new field at the time that uh, I was getting my PhD. This is a field that's obviously science-based and encourages really wide reading in a variety of, of different subjects. So in writing a book like this, I will say, and some of you are going to recognize this writer uh, who, who I'm about to mention as well. I followed the lead of another writer who I admire, Kim Stanley Robinson, who is a Californian. Uh, he lives in Davis and he's yet another English major like me whose books, in his case, science fiction, nonetheless rests pretty substantially on cutting edge science. So all this is why Wild New World is the kind of wide ranging book it is. I mean, you might even think of it almost as a nonfiction version of a Kim Stanley Robinson uh, kind of book. Let me tell you about how this book began. And this, I've never been able to say this about a book before. Uh, but I realized as I started working on, on Wild New World, and by the way, this was my, this is what I did on my pandemic vacation, uh, was to, uh, to write this book. But the origins of it, I realized as I began to work on it, actually date back to my oldest memory as a child. Among the stories in the pages of Wild New World, one of the ones I tell fairly early on in one of the early chapters to help readers understand the ideology that old worlders brought to America about the relationship between humans and animals is this one. And it's obviously a personal story since it comes from, as I said, the earliest memory 
that I have. And I think the reason this is my earliest memory is because, as you're about to see, it, uh, it is really saturated in a kind of an emotional reaction. I had my first animal companion, a little yellow chicken that I fed and watered and played with when I was four years old. So the primary play that uh, my chicken and I engaged in was chase. And one day as we raced through the house, dodging couches and kitchen tables and sewing machines, I miscalculated and I stepped on my chicken and killed her. So as we were burying my little yellow bird out in the backyard, I turned to my mother, both of us sobbing with this question. I said, I at least get to have Chicky again in heaven, don't I, Mom? My mom was a good Southern Methodist who was known all her life for sort of delivering the unpainted version of things, even to a four-year-old. And she responded with a take on the Western view of animals that I think ended up haunting me for a lot of my life. To that question, she said to me, why no, honey, chickens don't go to heaven. They're different from you and me. They don't have souls. You were made in the image of God and have an everlasting soul, so you'll have a life after death and go to heaven. Animals don't get to do that. They just die. I can tell you that even as a four-year-old, that kind of human exceptionalism just somehow rang false to me. But the idea lingered on in a probably, I think, a disturbing way in my mind. And I think it set me on the course one day to write this new book of mine, Wild New World. I also wrote Wild New World for another reason that I'll tell you. I've long been stunned that Americans remember so little about the marvelous biological diversity our continent once held, or understand the realities of how we lost so much magic from the world. Most of us recall a kind of a shorthand story that once there were millions of buffalo, then almost none. But who remembers that two centuries ago, Atlantic shorelines still harbored a northern hemisphere penguin, the great auk? That there was still an eastern prairie chicken, the heath hen, until the early 1930s? When my grandparents, my own grandparents were alive, passenger pigeons, which were once not only the most numerous bird in North America, they were the most numerous bird of a single species on the planet. Passenger pigeons still flew through the skies of Louisiana when my grandparents were alive. As they had done for 5 million years, a century ago, only a century ago, Wolves were still engineering ecologies all over the country. America's own parrot, the Carolina parakeet, continued to lend a tropical color to eastern forests only 90 years ago. Those birds that are described in absolutely uh, as brilliant additions to the southern and eastern forests all the way up to the Hudson River in New York have only been gone for 90 years. And ivory bill woodpeckers, our candidate for the largest woodpecker in the world, were yet available for ornithologists to study down into the early 1940s. Henry David Thoreau once lamented that in 1850s New England, he was not able to experience what he called an entire heaven and an entire earth. But precious few modern Americans seem to understand what having an entire earth might have meant. That absence of memory doesn't just make things like the restoration of wolves, for example, more difficult in our own time. It sometimes makes me wonder about our willingness to forget our impacts and whether or not, in fact, 
humans of the 23rd century, 200 years from now, will even understand that they live on an earth that previous generations of humans have overheated, or whether they'll wonder what the planet once was like and why or how it changed. I tend to believe, and maybe this is because I've I spent a lot of my life reading widely, particularly in historical subjects, that to understand reality, we really have to have a profound uh, sort of version in our minds of where we've come from, some story about ourselves that we understand that is accurate and lets us grasp something about the human trajectory through time. I will say to you that, uh, and I, I can't, uh, obviously in a book that's 400 pages long, I can't uh, give you a sense of the entire book or even uh, begin to touch on all the stories that I tell in it, but I'll give you a sense of some of the topics that I try to cover, at least a few of them, and some of the themes uh, that are in A Wild New World. One of the themes early on in the book uh, is to explain how North America acquired the rich, distinctive bestiary that we have and that greeted the first human arrivals so many thousands of years ago. So the, really the first chapter is an attempt to recreate after the, the great Chicxulub impact, that's the asteroid strike that took out the dinosaurs and ushered in the age of mammals and through uh, North American evolution plus migration to North America from other parts of the world managed to, over the ensuing 65 million years, fashion the bestiary that humans found uh, when they arrived here. Humanity's deep time close relationships with other animals is another theme that manifests in Wild New World, and it's there in many surprising ways that are still a part of our neurological and, and limbic wiring. And if you're interested in those, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit, but we still possess uh, genetics that harken back to the nearly 40,000 generations we spent as carnivores, as hunters of other animals. Uh, and, and those, uh, as I said, are part of our, our uh, limbic and neurological wiring yet today. The book investigates uh, American elephants, you know, our, our greatest charismatic creature when humans arrive uh, are mammoths and mastodons of, uh, of, of different species. And so I, I spent a good bit of time talking about North American elephants, how we acquired them, why we no longer have them in particular and, and how long they lasted on the continent. How people who established our first coast-to-coast -coast culture, the first coast-to-coast -coast human culture spanning from the Pacific to the Atlantic and basically from Alaska down to Northern Mexico, pretty much uh, occupying the boundaries of present day United States plus Canada and Alaska, dates to 13,000 years ago, and it lasted longer than the present United States has lasted. Uh, that particular culture I call in my chapter on it, Clovisia the Beautiful, uh, and it's the Clovis culture uh, that begins in North America about 13,100 years ago. And as I said, it lasts more than 300 years. Uh, there are earlier arrivals in North America. There uh, as a result of a discovery in White Sands uh, National Park in New Mexico about three years ago, we know that there are footprints that uh, stepped on grass seeds that have radiocarbon dated to 23,000 years ago. That's before the last great glacial maximum. So people got here before the height of the Wisconsin Ice Age, um, and we have their tracks we know they were around at least in this part of North America, probably got here by, by boat coming along the Pacific shore until they moved inland to this region south of New Mexico or south of the Southern Rockies in New Mexico, where I live. Um, 
23,000 years ago, people are here, but it seems as if, and this is a pattern uh, in the human migration around the world, there are these little outlier groups that far in advance of large scale migrations arrive in places. And that seems to be the case for this one. I tend to think of these very early arrivals as something like the Vikings uh, in advance of, uh, of uh, Europeans arriving several centuries later. Uh, there never seem to be very many of them. And when the Clovis people arrive down through the Ice Age corridor, the Mackenzie corridor that opens up into uh, Southern Alberta and across the rest of the Americas, uh, they spread across both continents of the Americas within the space of about three centuries. And that has implied uh, to some of us that there really wasn't anybody else in the way. Uh, that uh, this Clovis culture was able to spread so quickly. I also engage with how it was that in the 10,000 years that followed the Clovis and Folsom period, that's the end of the Pleistocene and a whole grand sweep of what are known as the Pleistocene extinctions when we lose many of our most charismatic animals in North America, including mammoths and mastodons. But how is it that in the 10,000 years that followed that, native people largely managed to preserve the biological diversity of North America undiminished over that extraordinarily long period of time. A period of time, by the way, when there is, so far as we've been able to ascertain so far, only one extinction that takes place, a flightless sea duck on the Pacific shore from Southern California up into Southern Oregon, finally became extinct during this 10,000 year period of Native America. But otherwise, that period preserves uh, all of the biological diversity that had prevailed in North America at the end of the Pleistocene. That, those stories comprise about the first three chapters of the book. And from chapter four through the end, and the book has an introduction, uh, 10 chapters, and an epilogue. So the heaviest weight of the book is on the period from the arrival of old worlders, uh, Europeans, Africans, and others into North America down to the present day. But one of the things I engage, because it's such a fascinating part of the story, uh, is how naturalists really come to explore and understand the wildlife of North America. North America wasn't supposed to be there in terms of what Europeans understood about the world. And not only was it not supposed to be there, but most of his animals were completely unknown. As uh, one writer said, the Greeks, the Romans, none of them knew anything about hundreds of these animals were inquiring in North America. So there was a general fascination about this story and so I spent a good bit of time uh, talking about uh, natural history and what these early naturalists bring to the game of describing North America to the world. So Mark Catesby, who is one of the first naturalists to, uh, to work in North America, is what I spend time with. William Bartram, who writes the first great uh, literary work, Travels, it's called. It's a natural history uh, done in literary fashion. Uh, and probably was the first American book that ever convinced Europeans that Americans were going to amount to anything in terms of, uh, of literary production. William Bartram is another. Uh, John James Audubon, obviously, I, I spent a good a bit of time on. Um, Alexander Wilson, uh, Audubon's competitor as an ornithologist in early America. And then a whole host of others, I won't mention everyone, but Ernest Thompson Seton, who of course, writes uh, all these stories at the beginning of the 20th century, attempting to translate Darwin's ideas uh, uh, for modern readers into how animals actually live. Uh, and then two people I spend a good bit of time with across two chapters are Vernon Bailey and Florence Miriam Bailey. Vernon Bailey is the primary um, wolf killer for the Bureau of Biological Survey in the early 20th century. He's just a farm boy from Minnesota with very little education, but he's really good uh, at catching animals. And he ends up being hired by Seahart Miriam, who's the first director of the biological survey and probably becomes the best wilderness naturalist in America since somebody like uh, uh, Meriwether Lewis. But he marries his boss's sister, Florence 
Miriam, who in contrast to him is a graduate of Smith College, is and is already become by the time they marry, uh, probably the most famous writer about birds in early 20th century America. And tracking their relationship over time becomes a really fascinating part uh, of the story that I uncovered about the role of the biological survey in attempting to wipe out American predators because Vernon Bailey was the point man. T Teddy Roosevelt referred to him as Wolf Bailey. By the end of his life though, his wife has managed to change his mind about wolves. And in his papers at the University of Wyoming, one of the most interesting things in Vernon Bailey's last couple of years is a photograph of a gray wolf in a trap with its foot caught in a trap with Vernon Bailey's handwritten inscription beside it that goes something like, so he killed a cow to eat and his feet are frozen. So maybe this doesn't hurt too much, but does he really deserve this? Did any of them really deserve this? And that transformation that Bailey undergoes in the period from uh, the early or the late 19th century, he first becomes an employee of the Biological Survey in about uh, 1896 or 97, through his death in about 1940, almost tracks what happens in the scientific community in America. And interestingly, it was, uh, it was his wife, Florence Miriam Bailey, I think, who really had an effect on him. I talk, of course, about Adolf and Olas Murray and their great works on, on coyotes, on caribou, uh, in Olas's case, and uh, most importantly, Adolf Murray's The Wolves of Mount McKinley, where, I mean, it's the only national park we have left in America that still has wolves in it by the 1940s when he's sent to study them. And what Adolf Murray brings to the science of wolves is his understanding that the relationships he's seeing uh, in Mount McKinley National Park, now Denali National Park, of course, have been going on in America for millions of years before Europeans came. And so he, along with Aldo Leopold at the same time, are among the first to begin to wonder what is it about European hubris that makes us think that we can come here and just weed the place without giving it any sort of thought whatsoever as to what's been happening before we ever showed up? So I spend uh, time with both of those, uh, the Murray brothers, and of course, Aldo Leopold, who, as I'll tell you in a minute, is one of the first to recognize something really important about the opportunity that North America has. And then Rachel Carson, uh, and many, many more, in fact, but I've obviously spent a good deal of time on both Rachel Carson and, and Aldo Leopold. All these people unlocked these ancient secrets about the bestiary uh, that existed in North America. I mean, and animals were disappearing right and left while many of them were, were working. And I'll say something more about that in a few minutes as well. I also devote a lot of time, as you can tell from what I've said about wolves and about the, the Murray brothers, to figuring out why Americans were so committed by their religions and their old world traditions to destroying the continent's wolves from the very first of their arrival. The first environmental act any European country passes in colonial America is in Massachusetts, and it's to place a bounty on wolves. Uh, and, and if you're interested in talking about this more, I certainly will, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it as I go through this, but this is a, a really perplexing story, and it has to do with what had happened in Europe largely before Europeans arrived, including the fact that the English haven't had wolves in the British Isles since the 1400s. So this is the first time in the early 1600s they've ever been around wolves, and they frankly don't, don't like the idea of it. I question why bison aren't wild animals in modern America. And 
how in the process of creating what we've all for a long time called the greatest nation on earth, America's market-based economy made possible 400 years of the most widespread and orgiastic destruction of animals in world history. I mean, we have no rivals in this and what we did in the 400 years, basically between about 1620 uh, and our present day. And then, of course, having done that, we pronounce that an act of civilization. Uh, to me, all that begs some explanation. And so I spend a part of my time working on it. Part of my story involves something called a theory of first contact. And let me explain to you how this translates into a story about animals. The Americas were the last continents on earth that humans found. I mean, we, we got to Europe, we got to Asia, we got to islands in Indonesia. We got all over the world until we finally managed to find North and South America. And then through the history of North and South America, humans are repeatedly new to the place. So first contact theory assumes that beings can only respond to the new with the ideas that are already in their heads. That means that first contact in several forms, biological first contact, where animals with no prior experience with humans had to learn to fear us, and cultural first contact, when Europeans and native peoples engaged in big conceptual misses about one another, play significant roles in the story of Wild New World. But I also write about something I call continental first contact, where Americans across the last five centuries failed to appreciate the vastly diverse and ancient ecologies they inherited and just acted on old world traditions that we brought to this brand new continent so that we strove to remake America in the image of European nations that had long ago, in some cases centuries before, destroyed all their own charismatic animals. Even when the United States created a system of vast public lands, anything unlike Europe possessed with respect to wild animals, we've still struggled to imagine our way out of the blinders of continental first contact. Those thoughts that are in our heads make up another theme that tracks through the book. I'm concerned throughout Wild New World with how humans see themselves in relation to the other animals inhabiting the world around us. So this is a story that ranges across human time and includes both Neanderthal practices, for example, along with the stunning 35,000 year old art of godlike animals on the cave walls of Western Europe. Our oldest worship often featured imagery of what anthropologists called therianthropes, which are figures that merge humans and other animals, often lions or eagles or bison, into a single creature. I continue to trace what I think that indicates, which is that we've long had a sense of our kinship to the rest of the living creatures of the world. We are them and they are us, in other words. Through that 10,000 years that Native Americans were here prior to the arrival of old worlders, with the accounts in their stories of kinship ceremonies that they performed to placate the animal deities. So that whenever humans overreached, and of course, as human beings, native people were like all the rest of us, sometimes they did overreach or act in hubris. Whenever we failed, they failed to pay proper respect to animals, ceremonies they performed that celebrated kinship could compare or prepare, I'm sorry, repair the rifts. So that in one of the lovely poetic uh, sentences about this, when the animals were called on again, the animals came dancing. Having domesticated so many old world species thousands of years back, Europeans, of course, arrived with a very different uh, set of religious ideas. These were ideas that sprang, and this explains a lot about where we are even today, from a long old world tradition of having domesticated animals and engaged in herding of creatures like sheep and goats and cattle. 
From Greek and biblical sources, Europeans believed they were made in the image of a deity that lived in the sky, and they were convinced that as a result, they possessed a magical but immortal spirit. So they were exceptional to everything else on earth. They brought with them a religious book asserting at every reading of it that God had created other animals solely for our use. Into your hands are they delivered, Genesis proclaims. As religions do, Judeo-Christianity explained how the whole world worked. Since a deity had created everything on earth in a state of perfection from the very beginning, extinction was impossible. It took until well into the third decade of the 19th century for Americans to begin to believe that there was something called extinction because their religion convinced them that that simply couldn't be. Predators like wolves, which were an annoyance to old worlders domesticated herds, had their origins with Adam's fall from grace in Genesis. So destroying wolves and other predators was actually an act of recreating humanity's original relationship with God. That kind of distance then between other animals and the human animal helped make it possible for Europeans to see the wild creatures of America as little more than natural resources and commodities in a global market economy. And that, of course, was one of the secrets about what happened to so many of our animals. I will say that seeing a correct human relationship to other animals doesn't seem to have ever been that difficult in the first couple of million years of our evolution. But in an early United States where its citizens believed animals should be sources of capitalist wealth, who believed that extinction could never happen because the world was unchanging, cracking this dam of old world certitude in order to see reality eventually would require somebody like a Charles Darwin, some genius whose blockbuster books finally reveal the great secrets of evolution. And most importantly, that like all the rest of the life around us, we too were spawn of Earth's evolutionary river. The first of those books, I'll remind you, on the origin of species only appeared 163 years ago in the Western world. And the inertia of human exceptionalism remained then and still is a powerful current in our culture. Finally, I'll say this to you, and this may come as some news. What we call the sixth extinction today has different origins than most of us assume. Unlike the fifth extinction, the last one before this one, uh, whose Chicxulub asteroid strike wiped out 75% of Earth's life in basically a, a matter of weeks, this sixth extinction is anthropogenic and has unspooled in slow motion across the last 25,000 years or so. In fact, a 2018 National Academy of Sciences article described as it described the loss of 300 mammal species and two and a half billion years of distinctive genetics when humans spread around the earth and arrived in so many places where the animals had no experience with humans before, that article referred to these migrations and these extinctions as close to a worst case scenario for biology. And then starting five centuries ago, scores of species that had been entirely healthy here in North America for as long, in some cases as 15 million years, proved incapable of surviving a mere 400 years as targets of market capitalism. The losses since 1500, for example, during which America's great auks, passenger pigeons, our parrots, most recently ivory bills declared extinct uh, only a little more than a year ago, became direct or indirect victims of capitalism. And that's cost us another half million years of Earth's distinctive evolved faunal genetics. In addition to being a narrative, uh, an attempt to write a story about uh, 
the wild new world that truly is a story with a beginning, a middle, and an ending. And it's different in form from any of the books that have attempted this before. There are only three. Uh, William Temple Hornaday, uh, his book, Our Vanishing Wildlife in 1913, is probably the first attempt to do something sort of like this. Peter Matheson's Wildlife in America, one of the great classics written in the late uh, 1950s, which is kind of a regional guide, region by region, to wildlife with some colonial history thrown in as another one. And then there's the Australian paleontologist Tim Flannery's uh, book, The Eternal Frontier, which is really good on, on pre, uh, pre-human America. But none of those books is really a narrative story. And so that's what I try to do with Wild New World. And I also tried to base it, of course, on the most up-to-date research. And what that offered as an advantage uh, is being able to call on the new genomic science to lay out this story. Uh, genetic and genomic science have uh, really been available to us only over the last couple of de- uh, decades. And laying out a story using genomic science has given us all sorts of previously unsuspected information on America's bestiary. Uh, for example, using museum specimens that preserve DNA This new science has been able to assess the genetic health of mammoths, of great auks, of passenger pigeons, and Carolina parakeets on the eve of their extinction, and to actually identify the likely causes for their disappearance. We've never been able to do that before. Genomic science uh, did for the last American mammoths, for example, who survived on Wrangell Island in the Bering Sea until 4,000 years ago, a kind of opportunity to look at the extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago in a whole new way, because those mammoths were probably an example of what happened to a lot of the species on the mainland, isolated into small populations, so separated that they couldn't share genes. Some of our species, like those last Wrangell Island mammoths, may have succumbed to what is now called genomic meltdown, where they simply didn't have enough genetic diversity to continue to reproduce. And finally, I will say this, genomic science has fascinating new things to tell us about ourselves as well. Our own origins as wild animals, for example, and our impacts on subsequent migrations uh, and our subsequent migrations around the world. So I will say, as I close this out, that Despite laying out a history that I know has probably sounded like an elegy for what once was, this is actually an optimistic book, as I concluded. Throughout most of American history, we told ourselves that aside from a few species we saved to be able to hunt, that it was inevitable that the continent's wild animals had to vanish. They were the collateral damage of progress and prosperity. In scientific fact, though, losing animals and almost every instance has been a deliberate cultural choice that we've made. 50 years ago next year, we made the very deliberate choice to pass the Endangered Species Act of 1973, reversing finally the mindless destruction that had stood as shorthand for American colonization. The ESA, as most of you will know, rested on a premise that other living species are after all our kin in Earth's evolutionary river. And like us as a species, they all possess one essential right, which is the right to exist. Eventually challenged in the courts, the ESA, so said the United States Supreme Court, was intended to halt and reverse the trend towards species extinction, whatever the cost. The court went on to call the the ESA the most comprehensive legislation for endangered species ever enacted by any nation. That law, I just want to remind you, was passed at a time when saving the world was not political. It passed 92 to zero in the Senate in 1973 and 390 to 12 in the House of Representatives. The Endangered Species Act at least I argue so in Wild New World, 
remains today on the short list of America's very best ideas. And it's proof to me that nothing in history is really inevitable, that we can find it in ourselves to change. So I'll close this by saying to you that while we're now in a historical moment, when an overheated planet is asking us once again to consider how our actions in a wholesale remaking of the earth might not be in our best interest or the best interest of other species, we should look back on the, e the environmental, excuse me, the Endangered Species Act, the ESA, and our own great restoration successes with wolves and condors and realize that it actually is possible for us to engage in a Hail Mary. So in a nation like ours that endeavors to lead the world by example, the Endangered Species Act is to me evidence that we've got change within us. When we needed a Hail Mary to slow and even reverse what seemed like unstoppable forces of destruction, we Americans actually managed to do it. That gives me hope for the future that we can in fact choose to change and end up saving our world. So thank you for listening to that. Uh, that's kind of a, a bird's eye view of the themes in the book. And so I'll stop and see what you guys would like to talk about. Okay, well, we have lots of questions coming in now. Um, I will start with Deborah, who asks, I haven't read your book, but I wonder if you have any suggestions for wildlife advocates to do to change our current scenario. I have shared information about the North American wildlife conservation model, and most people say, oh, that is horrible. <laughs> well, it's, it's a model clearly that relied, as I mentioned briefly, although I talk about it at a greater length, uh, some considerable length in the book, it's a model that basically focused on uh, the needs and desires of the hunting community to save the animals that were important to them. And of course, at the time when that was happening, we regarded virtually everything else outside the purview of what could be hunted or what could be introduced to hunt uh, as animals that we were perfectly willing to sacrifice. In fact, that in the old world tradition, in order to create a civilized world that were too wild to allow to remain, in a country that was supposed to be made uh, uh, on the model of Europe. Um, so, I mean, it's difficult for me to say exactly um, on, a, on a minute scale how modern wildlife managers can take on uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, difficulties that they confront. I mean, I follow, uh, like I know all of you do, um, the battles, for example, over wolf recovery in places like Wyoming, uh, Idaho, Montana, uh, and the Great Lakes states. And it seems like we're reliving the 19th century all over again. So I suppose one of my hopes in writing a book like Wild New World is to give people uh, a new appreciation of how this story has played out and to give us a sense that we don't have to go back and replay what happened in America in the 1880s and 1890s. Presumably, we should be beyond that. But if we don't know it, if we don't know those stories, then we are sort of condemned to repeat them. Thank you. So Mark says, he's a big wolf lover. He read that the sheer number of wolves in the West in the 1800s would have prevented our human expansion to the West Coast. Do you agree with that sentiment? And could coexistence have worked back then? Uh, that particular sentiment actually is straight out of Stanley Young and E.A. Goldman's uh, The Wolves of North America. They argue that American expansion across the continent was slowed by decades by the presence of wolves. Um, that's a little bit hard to credit for a couple of reasons. One of them being the fact that there were already people living in the West. For example, the settlers of New Mexico and California, which in New Mexico's case had been in place since the early 1600s, the same decades, for example, that the English were arriving on Atlantic shores. Uh, and 
in California from the 1760s onward. Settlement in both of those places didn't seem to be restricted by the presence of wolves whatsoever. And one of the interesting things that uh, Young and Goldman say in their book as they, they describe that uh, slowdown uh, by wolves of American expansion across the continent is that it seems to them inexplicable, almost impossible to, uh, impossible to explain how New Mexicans and Californians were actually able to survive when surrounded by wolves. Obviously, they did so, and both places were, were growing and doing very well during the period when supposedly wolves were slowing down American progress. So uh, I think that's, a, you know, that book was published in the 1940s. And when Aldo Leopold reviewed it for the Journal of Mammalogy, he actually addressed that particular point. And one of the things he said about their book was that, unfortunately, our new book uh, about wolves is not based on modern science. It's based on old world traditions and folk ideas about the role of wolves in the world. Um, and I think Leopold probably had the last say. Well said. So Pamela asks, has it been debunked that early indigenous peoples of this continent were in part responsible for the extinction of some of the larger ancient carnivores here? Well, uh, no, it's not been debunked. In fact, where we are in terms of understanding the Pleistocene extinctions, uh, and this is by now a pretty universal uh, accepted explanation among paleontologists and archaeologists, is that the arrival of humans who were really uh, superior hunters and predators. Uh, I mentioned earlier that that arrival uh, by the Clovis people rested on 40,000 generations of previous hunters. I mean, and I'll give, just give you one example about how good they were. There are three archeological sites in Southern Arizona, just Southeast of Tucson, where it's clear that about 12,000 years ago, uh, 12,800 years or so ago, Clovis hunters surrounded a herd of mammoths there were 15 animals in that herd, as far as could be ascertained, a bull, a cow, and 13 adolescents and calves. All 13 adolescents and calves were found killed in one spot, each of them with one Clovis point in them. The bull was found a couple of miles away with two points in him, and the cow was found at another site eight miles away from where the calves died. She had eight Clovis points in her. She obviously had fought just the way elephant females do to defend her young to the last. And it took eight Clovis spears in her to finally cause her to, to run away. So the uh, these sort of super predators arrive in North America among animals that as far as we can tell, had almost, probably not completely, but almost no prior experience with human hunters who were this good. There's only one example of an elephant killed in America before the arrival of the Clovis people. And those animals seem to have been, as I suggested in my uh, introductory remarks, probably over time, I mean, mammoths reproduce elephants today, reproduce really slowly. Uh, they probably were pushed into pockets of populations that were separated from one another so that at least some of them may have suffered the same fate as the mammoths on Wrangell Island. As for the predators and the carnivores, that's a more difficult question to figure out. But one of the best explanations that people have come up with is that very likely Animals like dire wolves, for example, that are, uh, if you've been to La Brea Tar Pits uh, in Los Angeles, you know that that beautiful display of dire wolf skulls on the wall uh, that they've dug up uh, or they've excavated from the tar pits are an indication that dire wolves once were one of our most prominent predators. But the speculation today is that they were simply outcompeted by gray wolves when gray wolves returned from Asia back to America about 30,000 years ago. So we have examples at least of some predators where it seems that uh, 
uh, later species who eventually became replacements probably outcompeted the animals of the Pleistocene. Um, there's not a whole lot to go on, though, on trying to explain the extinction of animals like saber-toothed cats, for instance, or American cheetahs. Um, probably they were outcompeted, but uh, that's the best guess. We're still struggling to understand the Pleistocene extinctions, but for the most part, the idea of climate change has sort of been eliminated. The idea of uh, a comet strike 12,000 years ago has pretty much been eliminated. The idea of disease epidemics has pretty much been eliminated. And what we're left with, the one thing, just like with climate change, that we don't seem to want to accept, what we're left with is ourselves. All right, shifting gears a little bit. Heather asks, I would like to hear Dan's opinion on the native horses that were once <clears throat> in America, North America, sorry on the Native American horses that were once on North America disappeared, and if he considers our current wild horses to be a reintroduced species. So let me offer to that question uh, the example of the horse versus the bison. Many of you know that the American bison, by act of uh, President Obama in 2016, became our national mammal. We only have two uh, national animals, the bald eagle, uh, whose uh, designation to that status dates back to the 1780s, and the American bison, uh, which joined the bald eagle in 2016. From the very latest archaeological, paleontological, and genomic science we have, bison have been in North America for about 250,000 years. Now, that's a pretty long time. By comparison, horses have been here, with the exception of the 8,000 years before Europeans arrived, horses have been in North America for 56 million years. They evolved here, later spread around the world to Asia and Africa, where they became uh, Shezvalsky's wild horses and various burrows and the zebras of Africa and the horses that Europeans ultimately domesticated and brought back to the Americas. But horses have been here for 56 million years. I mean, I have a map that shows the paleontological sites of horses in North America that shows sites in virtually every state in the Union from Florida to Alaska. In some places, they comprised as much as 25% of the biomass of animals during the Pleistocene. So they were and have been forever major players. What that to me explains, and I will, before I do that part, I'll just say that we don't know why they became extinct. There are some sites, archeological sites that show horses being killed 10,000 years ago by uh, early uh, Clovis and Folsom hunters and some of the the groups that follow them, but nothing like the horse kills, for example, that are in Europe. I mean, there's a site in France where 25,000 horses were killed in a, in a single site over time, several different drives and corrals, but nonetheless, we have nothing like that in America, although we do have evidence that they were killed. We don't really know what caused them to go extinct here and require for their reinsertion into American ecologies, Europeans to bring them back 500 years ago. But I'll just say the reason that they have done so well is because they were completely pre-adapted to North America. As soon as horses got loose uh, in the, basically following the Pueblo revolt of 1680. So from 1680 to about 1750, horses are beginning to get loose out in the American West. And we think by the end of the 1800s, I mean, that's a little more than like 125 years, there may have been as many as 7 million of them in the West. And the reason they do that is because they are so completely pre-adapted. I mean, our, our problem with the horse herds that we have remaining now, of course, is that what you need for animals like horses or mammoths or any other creatures is the full ecology that envelops them. And so in order for horses to be a healthy component of our ecosystems today, what you would need are lions and wolves 
to be back at full strength in full numbers so that they play the role they've always played with horses and help control their numbers. That's not the case in America. So instead we have this situation where wild horses are engaged in a continuous population eruption and we're struggling to figure out what in the world to do to try to control them. All the more reason why we need to bring back the large carnivores. Indeed so. Which yeah. leads me, I think we have time for one last question. So, and apologies, we're not going to be able to answer all these questions, um, which is always the case on these hour-long webinars. But Dusty asks, um, I work with an organization trying to restore wolves in Texas. There hasn't been a wild wolf in Texas in over 50 years. And I also work to restore prairie species like native grasses and Texas horned lizards. What do your studies tell us about the possibility of restoring things like wolves in places like Texas? Well, <laughs> so I lived in Texas for uh, about 15 years um, and taught, uh, as Camilla mentioned at the beginning of this, at Texas Tech University for a number of years. Um, it's difficult for me to say beyond, uh, you know, maybe uh, having fewer Texans somehow on hand uh, to block the introduction of wolves. I mean, we all remember when Mexican wolf recovery was proposed uh, and uh, it was possible for the states where introduction was proposed to reject it. Texas very quickly rejected the idea of reintroducing wolves into the state. Um, Big Bend National Park was one of the places that was being targeted in the state and the Texas legislature very quickly decided that that was never going to happen. Uh, Texas, as you know, like Wyoming, uh, is a state, uh, and increasingly Montana, although it was not that way when I was in Montana, but increasingly today, these are states that are controlled almost in the same fashion uh, that they were controlled in the early 20th century by livestock interest when it comes to questions like predators. And I think uh, as long as that's the case, uh, it's probably not going to happen. So maybe the best way to try to create the possibility for the recovery of wolves in Texas is to vote the Republicans out and vote in Democratic administrations that are going to be a lot more sympathetic to the idea of restoring natural ecologies. Well said. <laughs> we try to be bipartisan here, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Any last words you wanna share with this group? Uh, well, I think uh, I'm probably uh, speaking to, uh, in effect, a, a choir. Uh, the, I think the people who would be logging on to this webinar through Project Coyote are probably people who share my values and yours, Camilla, uh, about these issues. And uh, I guess what I would say is that uh, while uh, the story I tell certainly does track, as I said, into 2020, I mean, in order to hold a book to 400 pages, I couldn't do the kind of current management issues other than a handful of them that many of you are engaged with. But if you want to get a good sense of the big context of this story, um, try Wild New World for that. I think it probably will give you exactly that. And I would buttress that. I did get to, to read an advanced copy. I read it. Um, while I was actually visiting Norway and Svalbard. And I have to say that, as I shared with Dan, that going through an Arctic country that had dealt with so much of the similar kinds of human impacts um, while reading this book was quite, quite moving and made me think a lot about um, our place in this world, um, what we can do to better it. Um, and I hope I will say many of you are supporters of Project Coyote. Um, I'd be remiss to not mention that we rely entirely on the support of individual donors and foundations for our support. We have a matching gift campaign right now where we have three very generous supporters who have pulled together to offer a $100,000 matching gift campaign. So every dollar donated to Project Coyote now through the end of the year will be matched. Um, so I hope you might consider if you're not already a supporter of Project Coyote of joining our pack. Um, you can do so online at projectcoyote.org. 
And we will be sending out a follow-up email uh, with a link to this webinar. We'll have several links to um, Dan's books and a recent blog by Dr. Mark Beckoff, who's one of our science advisory board members who just did a fantastic um, interview with, with uh, Dan. So thank you all for joining today. Um, and thank you so much, Dan. Um, just grateful for all of your tremendous work. You bet. Thanks to all of you.